Good afternoon and welcome to the show. I'm Jim Fleisick. During today's show, we will discuss mobility strategies in the federal government. With me today on the show are Rick Walsh, the mobility lead at the U.S. Army, Rob Palmer, the director of Information Assurance Division at DHS, Har Sandu, the division chief of the Mobile and Remote Access Division, Bureau of Information Resource Management at Department of State, Brian Kopstick, the director of Mobile Innovation at HP Enterprise Services, and Bill Harrod, the public sector cybersecurity Security Advisor at CA Technologies. Let's get into the show and start talking a little bit about some examples, maybe, of where progress is being made using mobility in government. Let's start with Rick Walsh over the U.S. Army. Rick, where are some areas you see progress being made in, uh, in using mobility to, to, uh, to pull into your programs? The, um, right now, I would say the most exciting area that I have in the Army for progress in mobile is looking at the United States Re uh, Recruiting Command. They're taking advantage of mobile technology in a um, dual classification type environment where we have public as well as FOUO content on the same device and looking at reinventing the recruiting process, reducing the number of uh, steps and paper documents from 128 down to as, minimal, as few as 10 or 20. Oh, wow. So uh, it looks like it's going to be a great, great initiative, and we think it will really help out, give the Army a chance to be competitive in the recruiting business. Yeah, I guess it, that's important. Um, uh, Rob Palmer, how about over DHS? Where are some areas where you think progress is being made in using mobility to address some of the DHS issues? So thanks. So I, I would say in at least three areas, obviously interacting with the public for DHS is, is very important okay. and uh, in its mission. So, so a significant par portion of that is, is apps to the public. Mm -hmm. um, so I think um, FEMA, TSA, sure. ICE, we've got Absolutely. examples of, of mobile applications and um, that are helpful to the public. We also have emergency response is a huge part of the mission. Absolutely. So uh, how we integrate uh, mobile applications into the emergency response mission uh, is, a, is a significant area for us as well. And then lastly, just remote access, just enabling our, our workforce uh, remotely right. uh, using mobility technologies is a big big yeah. key for us. Yeah, I think that's going to have to be big for everybody. I mean, the right. world's changing. I mean, I think it's going to be expected to have uh, <coughs> work from anywhere, any place, any time. Uh, Brian Kopstick, how about HP? How are you positioning and using mobility to support your customers? Yeah, and I think you're really seeing some exciting things. We're moving kind of, you know, things are beginning to happen within mobility and government. We're moving, you know, from the rollout phase into what I would call the results phase. You know, to echo Rick's uh, comment on the Army recruiting, you know, I was actually talking to the team yesterday. And, you know, a lot of this is the challenge, what I would say, from a cultural movement from what I would say silo to systems think. And it's really how do we digitally transform these processes, you know, moving from not just simply an anytime, anywhere value proposition, but, you know, just even to tack on to Rick's point uh, of the fact that, you know, they got rid of 100 pages, right? It's really how do I reimagine that product or service and innovate in the delivery of it for a more effective, more streamlined. I think we're seeing things like mobility grow up. You know, there are some clear use cases where even BYOD makes sense, a visiting doctor in a VA hospital. But only about 11% of the agencies have a formal BYOD program. You know, I kind of joke sometimes when I talk out at the EBC, do you have a BYOD program? And, you know, yes or no, but in reality, you all do, which is whether you're part of the dialogue. And I think that's what we're starting to see as, you know, the cultural movement starts, and it's how can I do what I'm doing but really reimagine it. Right. Right. I think you're right, too. I think BYOD, whether you have one or not, you will have one in the future. I just think budgets and the direction of things going, at, uh, that's where we're going with all this. <coughs> Harsh on, too, at the Department of State. What are some of the areas where you're seeing progress made over at State? So, first, thank, uh, thank you for having me here. Sure, I think this coming. is my first time uh, being on the radio. So, uh, I will start a little bit of history of it, you know, where it all started from. Okay. So, if you look at it, it started from Federal Digital Strategy in 2012. And it laid a lot of uh, groundwork for all the federal agencies in terms of goals they right. need to achieve within a very short period of time. And I think, you know, from that point on, like all the agencies had a kind of a high level a guidance of what to do in the mobility arena. Before that, it was, you know, everybody was doing their own things. Right. So, uh, looking at the goals that were set by digital strategy, it really. Uh, enabled us, all agencies, to uh, collaborate together 
uh, in terms of, you know, some agencies were good at being, you know, uh, meeting the goals, mm -hmm. some were not. So uh, it, it really helped uh, form the collaboration group between uh, federal agencies. You know, if you uh, talk about, you know, some of the groups, Tiger Team headed by DOJ, we are actively participating in it. Then, um, and I want to go a little bit even back, uh, a little bit further than digital strategy. If you look at, there were some in DHS, Adana Roy heading the NEEM right. uh, uh, working group. It sure. was a critical piece, I think, in now that we are reaping benefits of in terms mm -hmm. of standardizing on information sharing. And also look at ISC. Uh, uh, by Schwinder Paul uh, and creating the shared services right. environment, right. which mo majority of the mobile uh, applications yeah. and uh, will be consuming those sure. things. That's so, interesting. We've had Schwinder and Don on the show talking about so, how they're collaborating on information sharing so with it, the NEEM model. Yeah. And uh, it, it's, it's kind of, they put the framework in place that we are reaping the benefits in mobile. So from state perspective, we have made tremendous progress in the last year and a half. Um, uh, one of the key priorities of our CIO is mobility, number one priority. And he's uh, really walking the walk in the sense that he's committed to making a department mobile. So when we came up with our department strategy, we looked at uh, digital strategy, our department strategy. The main key form of our department strategy is diplo uh, mobile diplomat. Okay, cool. A and uh, so, and what he did, you know, uh, is you know, one of the key decisions he made was to form a office or a division within our Department of State to focus on mobility. Okay, and that's uh, the one you're heading up? Yeah, that's Perfect. one I'm lucky to be part of. And I think uh, it really helped us focus down to um, basically working the issues of uh, standardization. Like, you know, uh, the main focus of this uh, office was to basically create an ec ecosystem in department that will, you know, conduce uh, adoptance of uh, mobile technologies. So we have been working intensively uh, since then to come up with standard application uh, development uh, and also look at uh, governance processes and so forth. So we have we have laid the framework uh, for in our department to move forward. Good. Terrific. Yeah, we'll drill down on some of those concepts here as we uh, work our way through the show a little bit. Uh, Bill Harrod, how about over at CA? How do you position uh, to support your customers? Where are some of your areas you see progress being made in uh, mobility? Thanks, Jim. So I think we're, there have been a number of, of good topics raised and, and good points. So at mobility, we're really looking at a number of different pieces. So today, our users in the federal space are bringing better, faster, more capable equipment into the office than the agencies can provide for themselves. And that's where we're seeing the expansion of the bring your own device. Um, and then we're also seeing the whole concept of derived credentials. So Jim, you know, you started in the CIO council. From that we got HSPD 12 and, right. and the whole requirement for a PIV card. Um, and today, we've got to figure a way to be able to move that credential um, onto a mobile device and be able to access uh, the applications and the data that our users need. We need to be business enablers. Right. So to be able to drive that business enablement um, out to whether it's a, a bring your own device or whether it's government furnished equipment, but mobility and the uh, the internet of all things, uh, the app world is is really where we're moving. So being able to to manage applications, being able to to manage the device, um, and being able to provide that strong authentication and authorization from a mobile device is where we're seeing uh, the most progress being made in the federal government. Yeah, I think too, I think so too. You know, that's a very good point. You know, we don't have time in the show to delve into security, remote access security, because that could be a whole show in, in and of itself with all the things going on there. But you do uh, highlight a very very important important point point there about how critical that will be. And, uh, and I do know the good news is industry knows that too. So every day we're seeing new, uh, new ideas and creative ideas to address that. Let's talk about a specific program. The, our listening audience also likes to hear about, is there a s specific program you could point to where you think something like really cool is happening, you know, and some neat stuff going on? Start with Rob Palmer this time. Rob, could you point your finger at maybe a specific program where you think mobility will really make a difference? 
Sure, and I think uh, I think I'll bubble it up a little bit. And Hart mentioned it is is I think it's really the most successful program that we've had okay. in the past this is the digital government strategy. Oh, okay, cool. And and just from the, the the groundwork, the foundation that it has laid from a from a from a collaboration perspective, mm -hmm. uh, I have conversations with folk folks like Rick and 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 others across the federal space about um, how we are. Uh, chasing mobility and and how we're enabling that workforce and, and and enabling the new business model, which is really what what we're doing. So I would say, the strategy itself and and the way that it organized resources around there's data, there's services, the security and privacy associated with it, has really uh, laid the groundwork for many of our strategies that that we have, um, as well as set a lot of direction for industry and their response to those strategies. So. I would say easily the the most successful program in the in the past three years is that that program yeah, itself. Having run the federal CI, CIO council myself, I think any program that gets people to collaborate and work together and kind of like like each other Absolutely. is it a successful Absolutely. program. Absolutely. You know, I mean, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I would agree with you. Um, Har Sandu, how about the specific program over state? Is there something you would point to and say that program's really making a difference? So at Department of State, we. Uh, the program of telework commuting is huge, and okay. we promote telecommuting uh, to find work-life balance uh, at Department of State. So, what you know, how we can support that program? So, one of the things what we uh, the program in the last couple of years had a huge success is a program called Go, okay. and it's our remote access solution, and it has over forty thousand users. Oh, wow. currently using it and it's been huge success so it promotes uh, feed into uh, mobility directly feed into a department wide or federal de department wide mandate of uh, promoting telework so it has been a great success for us also you know recently we are introducing uh, us a model of services, providing services in terms of platform. Okay, cool. So we had a, initially we had a distributed model, like for instance, managing devices, mobile devices. We have about 300 locations worldwide at State Department that we are managing. So each location had a, a, a device management platform. And so what we are doing is centralizing that function. Right. So we're coming up centralized uh, mobile uh, platform, which is device independent, that will enable us in a very short period of time to disconnect about 300 servers worldwide. That so, terrific. Uh, and it will eliminate that duplication. I think we are very excited about that. And we have started about 107 uh, locations have been migrated to central location. And uh, within the next three to six months, Terrific. We Terrific. I like that. Um, yeah, um, that telework. You know, I don't know where I work. I have no idea where I work. I don't know where I work, when I work, you know, uh, um, yeah, but um, I just know I work. But uh, it's that's the kind of world we're in these days, you know. Um, uh, hey, Rick, what's uh, what's going on over Army? You got a specific program there you want to tell us about that yeah. you think's making a big difference? I, uh, I mentioned earlier, it's what we got at the United States Army Recruiting Command, and it was really exciting for me is the fact that Mobile uh, is, I look at it in terms of three phases. First, you introduce the technology, and that's what we've done. And I say that as an industry because um, years ago I gave my son, when he was in seventh grade, I gave him a, a, a smartphone. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we're, we're past that. So the introduction phase is done. Now we're, we're, now we're starting to enable those devices. Right. And but with the recruiting command, we've already gone to step three. It's now we're actually changing the way we do our jobs. The recruiting command has taken on the smart device and actually is changing the way they do their jobs. Mm -hmm. They interact with young men and young women across the United States on their level, Twitter, Facebook, social media, to try and get them to try and find the best candidates to come into the Army. Right. Okay, that's in the public forum. That's not normally the way we do our job. We know the government, the Army is all about, you know, classified, unclassified, you know, sure. FOU information, but we've embraced the recruiter, the recruiting environment, and now working in the public domain, which is an, you know, again, that's where at that change phase from sure. introduction to embrace, and we're now in change with recruiting command. I need to get the rest of the army into change. Yeah. So recruiting command is my 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 prime example of. Now the the phone you gave to your seven year old, when you can't figure something out in your phone, does he fix it for you? 
Absolutely. Yeah, yeah that's what I, <clears throat> I call my kids whenever I can't figure something out, too, which brings up a point for all of you folks. You better get these platforms in place now because when the next generation of workforce enters, they're going to expect all this to be, uh, to be there. Uh, Bill Howard, what do you think? What's a specific program you've seen maybe that you think is making a difference in, uh, in actually getting helping government move forward? So I think there are a number of really significant initiatives within the government. FEMA has a bunch of them, uh, Department of Interior, so many of the, the federal workforce. It's not only teleworking, that's certainly a piece of it, but it's field workers, people in the field every day that don't have the ability to go into an office and sit down at a desktop or even a laptop. You know, the FAA uh, is now enabling pilots to move from carrying a 40-pound catalog case with all the manuals and all the maps to moving to an iPad. It has uh, certainly increased their ability to have the most uh, current information and, and much quicker to, to be able to search it and find it. You know, there was a, an aircraft that landed, did an emergency landing in Columbus just the other day. They weren't planning on that approach. They weren't planning on that landing. Um, I don't know what they used, but with an iPad uh, and the manuals and the maps on it, they could find it very quickly. One of the pilots said two or three minutes of searching through a manual uh, in, a, uh, in a distressed situation seems like a lifetime. So I think that's a huge place of being able to, to get much more current information, much lighter, much easier to manage. Yeah, that's excellent, Bill. It's always good to bring it back to the reality. I mean, you're talking about the possibility of saving lives there and you know, getting things done quicker, faster. Uh, Brian <coughs> Kopsik, what do you think? Uh, what, what, how, what specific program would you point to that you think is really making a difference? You know, I think there have been some really notable things, you know, within DOJ, within DHS, within Army that have been done over the past few years. But I really like Rick's example um, because, you know, as I said before, it, the anywhere, anytime value proposition is really almost, you know, think of it as stage one of the customer experience. But it's really how do we transform what we're doing and making it more effective, more efficient, streamlining the bureaucracy of government. And, you know, when they reimagine those types of things, they're converging, you know, you talk about interacting with them on their level. So you're talking about, you know, social media. It's when those interaction models converge that you really start to see real ROI because, I, you know, for as many apps as we've built, we will walk away from some because, you know, if there's not any business value out of it, you can't see the tangible ROI, it's probably not a good one, you know. And I think those types of things are really what people need to think about. What am I going to enable? What am I going to change? How am I going to completely reimagine that delivery? And I think the Army recruiting one is an absolutely fabulous example. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. I think it's some exciting stuff. I mean, we are talking about some fairly significant change here as we move to the, the world of mobility and the mobile workforce. I want to talk a little bit about um, lessons learned, things that you uh, guys are going through these programs, you know, some things that you're learning, maybe some things that you pass on to others that are good ideas, maybe a couple things you learned along the way that um, you'd uh, you know, perhaps caught you by surprise. But before we do that, we're going to take a short break. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. Welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. I'm Jim Fleisig here with Rick Walsh from the Army, Rob Palmer from DHS, Har Sandu from Department of State, Brian Koopstick from HP Enterprise Services, and Bill Harrod from CA Technologies. We're talking mobility and mo <clears throat> mobility in government. Um, let's talk about lessons learned. As, you've, as you're going through this process of bringing mobile apps into place and mobility into place, there have to be a lot of things along the way. Let's start with uh, Har Sandu over Department of State. What are some lessons learned that maybe you'd pass on to your colleagues that uh, they need to think about? So, Jim, how many you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I'll start off with basics. You know, if you look at business requirements, what are you trying to achieve? You know, looking at from uh, not detail level, but at, um, uh, at a higher level in terms of security, looking at information that will be provided on these devices or platforms, uh, functionality and performance. If uh, you can have mobile devices, if applications that you're building on it, architecture and performance is not right. there, guess what? Yeah. Nobody's going to use yeah. them. It needs a business case. Business. It needs, needs to make sense. So I think, you know, it helps in multiple ways. In terms of initially, when you select a vendor, you have basic 
guidelines that you are selecting against. And mm -hmm. once you select the platform, at that point you know which, uh, because technology is evolving in NDM sure. uh, or uh, in mobility platform wise. So what what it does is it will give you a head start while you are vetting the security pieces internally, trying to get the systems into production to work with the vendor right. and build those features that they are lacking. So it will give you leg up in terms of uh, getting the systems that you desire from security perspective, perspective, information and performance perspective. Yeah, terrific. Yeah. Terrific. So also, you know, keep in mind customer focus. You know, this is about customer. Right. That you're delivering solution devices, customers. So user experience, you have to keep in forefront. It has to, uh, whatever you deliver has to provide much seamless inter, uh, uh, seamless integration from desktop to your yeah. mobile device. Very so good. they're seamless. Otherwise, uh, you know, it will adoption of mobile will drag. Yeah. And so you don't want to do that. So making sure you listen to your customer, what you're trying to deliver, the functions you're trying to deliver, and setting the expectations before the system is rolled up. Excellent. You know, uh, but I learned that lesson too back in my Secret Service days when I showed the head of the presidential detail this really neat new tactical phone with all these buttons, software defined stuff. He looked at me and he threw it at me and said, Jim, people are going to be shooting at me. You want me looking to find these little buttons on here? You know, I want, I want, I want to push the button and I want it to work. You know, so, so you really do learn the lesson of understanding that customer perspective and making sure you don't forget. Because, you know, Technology guys can get caught up in all the gee whiz neat stuff, but you know, you, but it's the customer or, or your 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 client out there that's using it. Rick, what do you think? What are some of the lessons learned? For, from the Army perspective, I think what we learned easy in the beginning was uh, we started out as the devices were actually very interesting and, and a lot of fun, and people wanted them. But the mistake we made is we didn't integrate and didn't bring the full team together. You need to bring in your security people right off the bat because if you don't they want to fight you. You need to bring in your acquisition people right off the bat because first thing they're going to tell you is you're not authorized to buy it. So by bringing them in early and making them part of the decision process, you can actually move forward quicker because now um, mobile is really not, uh, or for me in the Army, it's really not a technology issue. It's a business issue. It's a political issue. It's a personal issue. People don't want to do it because it's different. So by integrating and bringing the full team together as early as you can, I think you, you, it's a better road to success. Yeah, very good points there too. Also, <clears throat> you know, getting, uh, and I guess the interesting thing to me is, you know, in, in the, the days of computers and all, you would have an upgrade cycle about every five years or so, and now with uh, mobile devices, you know, um, every six months there's a new device out. It's going to be an interesting challenge. I guess it, it does sort of set up things about, you know, managed services and, you know, and, uh, and using the devices as a service as opposed to actually purchasing things. and. It's going to change the model, which brings the procurement people into play for new models for how to do that. Absolutely. Um, Rob Palmer, what do you think? What are some lessons learned along the way? What, what are you bumping into here as you move along? So I think as you already discussed, the, the, the technology in the mobility space is just evolving faster than, than we can um, keep up with, and certainly at a, at a greater pace than the traditional endpoint. So, sure. so that's, um, that's one key lesson learned is that we've got to increase the pace or find ways to, to deliver this on a, on a more rapid pace. Uh, the, the other is, um, you know, we've talked about it a few times in terms of changing the way you imagine how you're doing it. And, and we started with this, this phase of, well, let's just make everything mobile. So we had a lot of mobile websites and, and we, we, we displayed them better on the, on the smartphones. But now we're really getting into this where our business and mission representatives are being very creative in terms of how they use these devices or these platforms to do their job. And it's our job to respond. Sure. Uh, so, and that, that, that becomes difficult. It comes down to the user experience, and, and folks have talked about that. Um, the one, I guess, highlight I'll make is, is really, from, from DHS's perspective, it took us, uh, it took the, the community a while to, to develop those governance processes on the traditional endpoints, so desktops, laptops, and, and, um, and there's really no expectation that it's not going to take us a while to figure this one out, too. It really is a, a, a new uh, distribution platform, a new, a new uh, maintenance um, processes that are, that are needed in order to effectively support the user in this space. So as we develop those 
from concept to, to decom, and you were talking about that cycle is mm -hmm. is much much more uh, rapid at this point. So, I would say we need to focus on the acquisition model, um, the sustainability models that we have in place for these these devices and the ecosystem. Yeah, that terrific. Around. We could probably hit it more on the challenges, but I you know I can just see environments of trying. You talked about governance of trying to decide you know what we're going to use, how we're going to use. Remember, remember the days of uh, Word Perfect versus Word. Now I can see the days of you know Apple versus Android versus BlackBerry versus whatever you know, and everybody with their their favorite. Uh, uh, Brian Koopstick over at HP. What are some lessons learned you're seeing? as you work through these issues? Well, I think I'll even tack on to some of the previous points made. You know, experience trumps device. At the, oh, end, I like that. At the end of the day, uh, I'll use your analogy of the tactical phone, you know, understanding the context of the user and what is happening around them is really going to drive what I'm able to do. You know, certain interactions, certain exchanges make sense on a mobile device. Actually, I would argue that mobile is fit to form computing. Hmm. Um, you know, in reality, the same transactions I'm going to do on a mobile phone versus what I'm going to do on a tablet versus what I'm going to do on a PC. Right now, about 62% of all transactions start on a mobile device but finish on a PC, okay? Interesting. The only time we've seen an inflection was actually, they call it uh, Cyber Monday, but it was actually Cyber Friday this year. There were more transactions uh, okay. that day than anything, and more of them were mobile at an increasing level, but they were from tablets. So it's probably people sitting around their living room. You know, after Thanksgiving, you know, I was doing the same thing myself, you know, surfing for Christmas presents to try and get that out of the way prior to the Christmas rush. Um, I'll, I'll even tack on to some of the other ones, uh, you know, to Rob's point earlier, you know, we saw a lot of what I will call random maximum mobility. You're seeing mo little mobile websites, things like that. But, you know, understanding where I'm really going to drive value from it is going to be key. And... As I said, I'd rather just even echo and even further extend, but process plus policy equals time, and time kills everything. In 2010, there were four releases per app. This year, they're going to average about 36 releases per app. And, you know, if you just do the quick math, that's three releases per month. Could most of the organizational processes, tooling, things like that, you know, support doing three releases a month without killing the people? the process or the organization all at the same time. Um, I, I just really think people need to rethink your role in the organization, defining a different operating model, building inside out, you know, really highlighting that user experience, but making it seamless because the reality is is 60% of all mobile enterprise apps just aren't used. And unless we're, that's about ERP adoption right. rates. Unless we're doing something to drive that adoption curve, there's no business value in an app that doesn't get used. Yeah, excellent point. I know when I look at my phone and I push on the buttons, it brings up all apps. I don't know what half of them are, so I, I know I'm not using them. But uh, very good points there. I like that. Um, <clears throat> Bill Howard, what do you think? What are some of the lessons learned or things you see that you'd uh, perhaps pass on uh, to others that uh, perhaps help them move along in their, their efforts? So I think with the federal clients that I work with most, the, the biggest lesson learned is that policy isn't keeping up with the technology, right? So, and this is nothing new, right? We have had this problem for a long time, but as lots of people have already pointed out, the technology is changing so quickly that we need a way of being able to, to wrap policies around it that make sense. Um, we need to be able to provide that anywhere, anytime access from any device for our users. Um, and our users are our internal users, our employees, but they're really the citizens too. And, and much of what we're doing in this eGov world is how do we enable citizens to be able to access the applications that they need and to be able to know who it is, what should they have access to, um, and how do we give them the appropriate access um, with the right policies wrapped around it. And with the way applications are changing, we really need to be able to instantiate that policy um, around the application itself um, and being able to control it at that level to be able to do the authentication, the authorization, the access control that we have traditionally done at perimeters and, uh, and through a number of security points, all that goes away as we move to uh, this explosion of apps on every device. 
Um, and I think we need to, policy needs to expand, and we need to w have a way of wrapping that policy around the application for uh, consistent, effective enforcement. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think there's going to have to be new models, new new things. I, you know, we talk maybe managed services or something, but, you know, we, we talk about we're approaching a world where decision-making in a time where, where time equals zero. I mean, you, you exactly know, things right. have to happen like that, especially when you think of a place like Homeland. I mean, you know, you may not have warnings when something's going to happen, and you're going to have to be able to respond immediately. Um, let's talk a little bit about priorities. What's uh, what's going to happen? What are what's important to you now? What are some of the things you're going to try to get done the next year, Rick? What's important to you for the next year? Uh, it was brought up earlier. Right now, our, our large focus is on um, identity management within mobile. How are we going to identify the user, which falls into uh, proper access, proper controls? But you know, and. To say that we have we have policy and HSPD 12, the Army implemented HSPD 12 using the CAC, right. the Common Access Card. Right. So that was a that's a solution to a requirement. Okay, I don't want to build my environment, my new mobile environment, based on a Common Access Card. I want to build it based on what the requirement was. The requirement was strong authentication. So Drive Credentials gives me strong authentication, but it still allows me to use my embedded infrastructure that I've spent millions of dollars on establishing, but it takes, I'm trying to get away from CAC, CAC devices, those kinds of things, but I still want strong authentication. Right. Right. So identity management is going to be critical for the future of for future mobile within the Army. I'll tell you, I've seen a lot of cases in, in remote access, and I believe, Jim's opinion, there is no one solution for an entire agency. I think there are multiple different pieces that go to that. You need a tool set. You know, some people have much more stringent requirements than others and you know you don't want to have the uh, a, a extremely costly approach for everybody when some people just check email for example so i actually think you need sort of like a tool set of multiple ways for remote access that, that's exactly a, a, a real quick point and then to, to say is that we need to build our security models appropriate to the business case mm -hmm. we don't Absolutely. want one size fits all because when we do that we disable capabilities on the devices by right. locking them down. And that's, again, a back to the recruiting command, is that's a public use environment with rules that are established for public use, which are not the same as the rules established for FOU and unclassified use. So we have to be adaptive in our security models, adaptive in our security architecture, but make it relevant to today. Don't go back and put the 20-year-old um, the technology into play on a brand new device right. because it doesn't fit. That's right. That's right. I agree with you 100% on that one. I think, uh, and the, the you know having a, a tool set, you get creativity and innovation, and the, and the vendors all feel like they've got to compete with one another and get the best thing out there. Rob Palmer, what's important to you for the upcoming year? So we talked about it a little bit. Uh, at DHS, we we definitely see apps as the the center of the effective user experience. Mm -hmm. So. You know, all the things around it, it really comes down to what information is getting to the user. Is it at the right time and is it at the right level? And, and, and can that user be effective in, in, that, uh, in, in their mission? So, so really, we're hyper-focused on deployable solutions. Uh, we got lots of deployable technologies, but not too many deployable solutions. And, uh, and so what we find ourselves in is, is, is the, as a federal entity, kind of uh, as the integrator. So, so technology and, and industry have done great in responding um, to various aspects of mobility. Uh, and, and so now I think we're moving to that area where we can bring those, we're, we're starting to get to the point where we can bring those solutions together, integrate those, and provide solutions uh, to our users. So that's, that's really where, where we are focused over the next year. We know we've, we're, we're running out of time in terms of the, the app explosion and, and the, the, all those creative ideas and innovative ideas that we're talking about. They're going to have to have a home here shortly. Yeah. So, so we need to, to, uh, to get on that. That's, that's where we're focused. Cool. Very good. Very, uh, Horace, Andu, what do you think? What's, what's, what's important to you for the next year? So <clears throat> our short-term goal is to have when the Department of State hires a new employee, give him a mobile device, tablet, and a phone. So, you know, that's what is driving us. Uh, so looking at uh, real short-term, like I alluded earlier, that we are looking at centralizing our uh, management uh, platform for mobile. So we are going to introduce that actually next month 
a new platform uh, uh, as a supplement to our legacy BlackBerry platform. So our reliance on one vendor uh, will be alleviated with two uh, platforms. This new platform is as a total mobile platform in terms of it provides management capability, security pro, standard security pro, a profile through the enterprise, and also application management standard. So it's a complete solution. So once we have that foundation, then we can look at, uh, actually we are already collaborating with other agencies to see what we can use in terms of commercial apps. Right. We don't want to give you a mobile device and it's a brick. Yeah, right. No app, nothing access to it. So what we are looking at is uh, initially offer some of the uh, commercial apps that are approved by other federal agencies, so we're trying to leverage their experience, leverage their work to introduce some of the, uh, and streamline our processes in terms of introducing uh, those uh, applications. And also, you know, uh, looking at, currently majority of our application in federal government are informational based. It's like a newspaper, right. read, provide information. Right. Uh, now we want to transition over to interactive where it's uh, doing business functions, right. where More our mission, sta stuff. mission stuff, where our staff is able to uh, go anywhere and work and do the business functions. Yeah, terrific. Very good. Uh, Bill Hired, what do you think? What's, uh, what's hot in your list? What's on your front burner for the next year in this, in this space? So I think the priorities that, that I really see with the federal agencies that I'm working with um, are uh, many of them around some of the things that Rick mentioned. Right, so we're looking at how do we provide the derived credential? How do we provide the ability to have risk-based adaptive policies around the applications? Um, and I think everybody is looking at how do we do this given the current budget? You know, the state of Virginia has begun an initiative to reduce what they're calling errant payment, essentially fraud. Um, if we can figure out how to provide these services, particularly government services to our citizens, um, and have it reduce fraud at the same time, then we begin to get back some funding that can actually support these initiatives. Um, I think budget is going to be the, the, uh, the biggest obstacle to, to all of these initiatives in the coming year. Yeah, terrific point. Brian, what do you think? What's important to you upcoming year? So I think we're really focused on, you know, increasing the integration with some of our other products, our other initiatives, um, you know, take the CDM contract, you know, integrating that with the our mobile management and our security-based frameworks. Um, because what we're really trying to do is almost enable a digital DNA within these enterprises. And that's almost, we've got to move from a compromising the user experience to really an, an enterprise without compromise. And because too many times we're compromising the user experience as a result of being an, an enterprise itself. And you know, we actually are going to even talk about that and outline some of that strategy um, in an upcoming Gartner newsletter. But uh, you know, because the Anytime Anywhere Access, I actually recently got that question on a panel. When's the last time you saw somebody fill out their tax return on a mobile phone? Right. That, that, that's not going to happen. So it's really more about optimizing the transaction to enable it, somebody to do something, whatever it is better, faster, more effectively. Um, and, uh, you know, the term I'll even just tack on to Williams, you know, the Navy uh, people taught me a new term. It's called the eye brick. The eye brick. <laughs> um, because, I mean, if you disable all of the things that make it unique, you're also dis disabling all those things that enable you to be more productive. Terrific. Uh, that was great stuff. Um, we want to talk about challenges and we want to take a look to the future, but first we need to take a short break. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. Welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. I'm Jim Fleisick here with Rick Walsh from the U.S. Army, Rob Palmer from DHS, Har Sandu from Department of State, Brian Kopstick from HP Enterprise Services, and Bill Harrod from CA Technologies. We're talking mobility and government. Let's talk about the hard stuff. Let's talk about the, the, the things that are, that, that, that are in the way, things you still need to get done in order to uh, uh, you know, get where you want to go with these programs. Uh, let's start with Rob Palmer this time. Rob, what are some of the things, the uh, challenges you face every day that you need to overcome in order to, you know, achieve the results you're trying to get? 
First, I'll just highlight, I mean, there's been a tremendous amount of, of great work. Uh, as I mentioned before, you know, we've got a lot of deployable technologies and, and, and all of that took a lot of work and, and, and collaboration in that. So, so I don't want to diminish that at all. Uh, where we're, like I said, where we're moving towards is how do we bring all of that together? So, so we've talked about it here. It's the user experience. It's, it's, you know, how effective are they? What's the value to the mission? Well, really, it takes a, a seamless, cohesive yeah. environment to do that, which is, which is that next step. So how do we integrate uh, single sign-on through derived credentials to get to applications? How are the applications utilizing the infrastructures when the infrastructures are now changing? So now instead of private data centers and, and nice little neat boxes that we have our data in, it's spread across right. cloud services. Right. And so how are we using apps and, and the technologies and these seamless solutions to get that data, which is the most important piece, to the user so that they can get there yeah. in a timely fashion so that they can get their job done. So, so that's, really, that's really the difficult challenge is how is now all of this great work that has been done going to come together so that we have that seamless solution yeah, for the very, users. Very well put. It, it's more complex when you begin looking at it. It's not that straightforward. You give Absolutely. somebody a device and everything, right. and you're off and running. Uh, Horace Sandu, what do you think are some of the challenges, some of the constraints you still are trying to get through to get where you want to go? Due to you know, uh, our global footprint at Department of State, our challenges is going to be security and uh, balancing between security and functionality. Mm -hmm. So that will continue uh, for us, and we need to be able to find a median where users are able to have good experience with their mobile devices and also continue to make sure they're secure as well. Um, other, you know, a couple of major points are offsetting setting costs. You know, if you look at the traditional legacy way of doing things, our life cycle for refreshing technology is three to four years. Now you're looking at new mobile devices coming every quarter, every six months, new OS coming out. How do, you, how do we offset those costs as we're driving mobility right. in terms of space, in terms of uh, what we do? We need to find that you know, offsetting cost. Otherwise, if departments don't uh, work towards thing where we can uh, save, uh, the cost will be continue to increase. Uh, and as you know, in our budget climate, in you know, a cost like every year, Oh, yeah. uh, IT's hit uh, first uh, part to be hit and uh, cutting the budgets. Yeah. Um, other major, uh, you know, issue is a culture. Aha. culture. So, it, you know, of the organization, it, it is it's, uh, it, it is a huge, huge, uh, I think, a barrier in adoption of uh, mobility moving forward. You know, think about this. You know, you walk into your office. It has to have a desktop and a phone, wired phone. Now, if you have a wireless device, mobile device, it has a phone, why do you need a desktop? Right. So it's a cultural sh you know, shift. How, and how does we make that change? And I think at Department of State, we are looking at training, and hopefully a new talent is coming in, uh, driving that change. So I think that will, uh, by itself, uh, will take a little time. And quicker we do it, better it is. Yeah, absolutely. And, Very good. The, um, the, and I'm glad you brought that up. You know, you guys are too young to remember Groucho Marx with his You Bet Your Life show, but when you said the magic word, you know, a duck, uh, culture's our magic word on this radio show. This is the 109th radio show. It's the 109th time somebody brought up culture in the challenges section. I mean, uh, it, it just is, it's always there. You're exactly right. You're exactly right. Uh, Rick, what do you think? What are some of the challenges and constraints that, uh, that you see that you need to sort of surpass to get to where you want to go. It's been said already today, and it's, it's critical where we are. Um, we're, we're the Army, the DOD is in physical crisis. We don't have the money we need to do to do our job. So money is probably the biggest issue that we've got. Okay, and with that comes uh, the second largest uh, issue I have is, or the challenge, is what we call time to market and time to value. Okay, industry uh, talks time to market is the time it takes Samsung, Apple, or, or Microsoft, or even BlackBerry to bring a device into the store that you can actually buy it. Now, that's when you as a consumer can buy it. That doesn't mean I as the Army can use it. So well, from that point forward, it's called time to value. From that point forward, when can I use it? Now, considering the time the market takes to bring on new devices, if I take 90 days, I've consumed half of that useful life of that device for time to value. So I have to reduce time to value. So 
we're working with Samsung, we're working with Apple, we're working with the vendors who produce these, these, these devices and hardware to reduce time to value. That is, they will, they will give me a product that's ready for me to use the same day as commercially ready to use. We're not there yet, but that's what we're working towards. Excellent that's our point. biggest challenge right now. Yeah, excellent point. I never thought about that. You know, when a new commercial product comes out, that doesn't necessarily mean the government can use that product. There's a, so, um, you know, reducing that time between commercial launch and time to value, as you uh, mentioned, it's a very good point. Um, we've got uh, about 12 minutes to go, and we always like to talk about the future here, about the, where where the stuff's all going, how these programs will make government different in the future, What are what, what's the crystal ball look like. Let's start with Bill Harrod over at uh, CA Technologies. Bill, what's uh, what do you see in the future uh, that we'll attribute to these mobile technologies and these strategies we're talking about here today? What's the world look like down the road? So I think the real vision is how do we balance productivity and security and applicability, right? So how do we take a device that uh, people want to use, people have today in their hands? You know, they're saying that nearly all of our users have a smart device and that by next year, more internet and application-based transactions will occur off a smart device than will occur off of a desktop or a laptop. So how do we leverage that productivity and still be able to put the types of controls around it we need? How do we leverage something like geofencing so that I can't use certain aspects of it within the SCIF or within a particular building? Or how do I put time fencing around it so that I can only use certain applications during appropriate times of the day? It comes back to risk and understanding what our risk is, how do we protect that, um, and yet how do we push this productivity out to our users um, and out to the citizens. Um, and as we move to the internet of all things, talking about having cars and, and refrigerators and everything connected to the internet, how do I manage those application interfaces so that I can provide the sort of services that are required uh, and yet do it in a way that doesn't compromise my own security? Excellent, excellent. I actually seen it, saw a device was demoed that if you hit a serendipity app, it shuts off all the business apps. If you hit a business app, it shuts off all the serendipity apps, you know, those kind of things. And I think they're coming. I think industry knows. Um, Har Sandu, what's, the, what's your crystal ball look like? Where's this all going down the road? So I think in short term, what you will see is our uh, in federal government uh, transformation happening from legacy systems moving over to a federal, uh, sorry, over to mobile platforms. And also you will, when this transition happened, you will see our business processes changing from paper-based, you know, uh, see, it will be a lot more efficient, so we'll be able to provide better services to public. Um, and I also in a strongly believe mobility word will be a dictionary word in another year, year and a half. Wow, you uh, re and you can try now, sure. ask a nine, 10 year old, what is mobility? And most probably he's going to say it's car or moving from here to there. Mm -hmm. And they don't think about the you know, mobility in terms of devices, able to do work, getting real-time information. So because that's given to them, the, that's understood. I think it will become a culture or uh, it will get infused into us that mobility is a given, like given that. thing. Um, and also looking at from enterprise standpoint, uh, wherever we are doing point solution, it will have kind of a seamless integration I talked about earlier, not between mobile devices and desktop. Think about smartphones. Think about, uh, uh, sorry, uh, smart t TVs. And uh, so if you look at it, or watches now, smart watches, so it won't be a long ago you know, uh, down the road when you look at you know, you, if you set up alarm at five o'clock, you might wake you up at, you know, alarm might wake you up at three. He would say, well, we got an alert from WTOP, there's right. traffic jam, Absolutely. you have an important meeting at nine o'clock. Guess what, you need to get up and so you can make it on time. So those kind of things you can happen because we'll be capturing so Absolutely. much information digitally. Well done. So going from that, now I think from mobility, it's gonna change over to data management and data analysis. Cool. So I think that's the trend you will see, and uh, a few of my colleagues, colleagues talk about uh, uh, identity management will be a key. Now you have all this petabytes of petabytes of data, what do you do with it? Right. 
what information X, Y, Z we able to see. Right. So it becomes a, it will become a huge issue that we need to tackle right, right. now. So. Okay. Terrific. Well said. I like that. Um, Brian Koopstick, what do you think? What's, uh, what's this look like down the road to you? You know, I think we're at an inflection point in so many industries. Everything from education to grocery shopping to over-the-top types of services for the dissemination of content and information and clearly the digitization of the human condition. You know, clearly we're starting to see that within the VA and some of the others. Um, as everything almost uberfies and where the sharing economy takes hold. And as we start to tip over. I saw a tweet in my feed the other day, but I, I really feel it captured the spirit of our progress in about 16 words. We call taxis differently. We book hotels differently. But the way we inter have interact with government hasn't changed. The governments around the world are just, you know, really beginning this journey. And we have to clearly understand, they have to clearly understand their value chain and where those key moments of truth are. You know, you know if I look at it, link one, it's those internal value builders. It's employee satisfaction. You talked about it, Har, where it's you know driving, recruiting, retaining, you know the next generation of workforce. I think the Army recruiting is a perfect example. How can I use my existing labor more effectively? And then there's those external value builders, where customer satisfaction. How do I erase some of the artificial distance barriers between people, information, processes, to enable greater productivity? And I think really what we need to do now is up our game. The government is, you know, really trying to do its part. I think the foundation is there with the digital government strategy in reinventing itself. And, you know, it almost has to come up with a new model in how it interacts and responds to the different constituencies. It's not just, you know, we like to say make it matter at HP. It's make it happen because Einstein said it best. We're not going to solve the problems of today with the same level of thinking that created them. And Perfect. I, Terrific. Well said. I love it. Um, Bob, <coughs> Rob Palmer, what do you think? What's it look like down the road to you? Where's all this stuff going? So I think uh, I think a fair assumption would be that we're going to see further adoption of of, uh, of shared and cloud services, which which is only going to lead to that that further convergence of cloud and mobility. So so what's important with that, and 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 what is important with that is that um, that we have an identity based access to uh, more intelligent. Or through to data through more intelligent applications. So, so, so what I would say is is going to happen is that we're going to see a lot of development in how we categorize and store data, uh, application development structures, uh, and and um, security monitoring methodology. Okay. So, so that's th those are the areas that I think are going to uh, boom. And then la lastly, I would say the silos of expertise and knowledge will become less. Prevalent. So as we move forward with this, you can already see it. Collaboration is huge, um, and uh, and I think that that what once was pockets of greatness are going to be spread, um, across. spread across. Terrific. Well said. Good ideas. Uh, Rick Walsh, what do you think? What's the future look like for you? What's it look down the road? The future, future mobility, future of where we're going. It may not even be in mobility. I think we have two things that we need to address. Those two things are the individual, that's my business user, that's my knowledge-based user that actually needs information, and the information or data itself. I want to get to the point where that's all I worry about. Do I have an authenticated, validated, authorized user accessing data that they're authorized to get to securely? So at that point, the device becomes redundant. The device becomes just a mechanism for that exchange. So I want to get to where all I worry about is the user, is he true and authenticate and has access to what he needs to do to make a decision? Therefore, is my decision that he needs access to properly managed, secured, and available? So individual and data, that's my future. Individual and data, I like that. Um, let me try to do some summarizing here. I always uh, take some notes, as you see while you're talking. Let's, uh, we talked about progress, but I think what we all agree with is there's tremendous progress going on um, in, in the in mobility. Um, the remote access remains some challenges out there in that progress. Uh, we see it, we've seen increases in BYOD and how that's being implemented. Uh, we see in, uh, a lot of increases in governance. 
for uh, progress being made for collaboration. Many of you talked about how mobility is requiring a lot more collaboration across government around that digital government strategy. And things are get, getting better and they're getting faster. And uh, th there's pressure on to do that. Um, we heard about the digital government strategy as a specific. Telecommuting becomes a big deal and will continue. And the Army Recruiting Command is a, a specific program that I think was cited by many of you here as being something that's um, <coughs> a, a real specific program that's making tremendous progress. Uh, we talked about lessons. Uh, one, one that uh, you know, hit home with me quickly is stick with that customer perspective. Don't forget that you're, you're really building these things for your, your customers, not for your, your techies that want to do gee whiz things. And you need to include all the stakeholders. That came out pretty close, too. It's not about just a group, but all the stakeholders. Um, we talked about life cycles and upgrades going to be uh, challenges, and, and perhaps lessons could be more managed services kinds of things as opposed to actually purchasing of devices in order to have a model that can keep that life cycle, you know, short or shorten that life cycle, uh, especially with the, the length of time it takes the government procurement processes to work through. And lessons, uh, governance came up again when we were talking about lessons, uh, the importance of governance. <clears throat> when we talked about priorities, what jumped out right away was identity management. What jumped out, uh, you know, that that identity management and pr the authentication of who's using the device becomes a real enabler to a lot of these uh, 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 initiatives we're talking about. And, and making the apps the center of the user experience came out, you know, it's, uh, it, it, as, a, as a goal. And of course, the integration of products. Um, there's so many different products out there. There's so many different debates over which products to use, when to use them, and so forth. Challenges, complexity came out there. This is, this is uh, more complicated than you think when you try to put this stuff together. Uh, we had the challenge of security versus functionality. We had the challenge of cost and budget. And of course, the big one that always comes out in these discussions, culture. We're talking about doing things different. When you talk about change, you talk about resistance to change, you talk about new cultures. And finally, looking towards the future, we talked about different models, talked about different ways to do perhaps managed services. I believe if we can solve the identity management issue with remote access and bandwidth continues to increase, that we haven't even touched our imagination yet of what's going to be able to be enabled in the future. I think there's some really wild stuff coming down the road once some of these initial issues <clears throat> are solved. With that, I want to thank our panelists first for taking time from your very busy schedules to come here today and share your expertise with us. Um, thank the sponsors for uh, sponsoring us today, without which we don't have a show. And of course, thanks to all the good people here at Federal News Radio. And last and most important, thanks to our listening audience out there that tune in. You've been listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM.